Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, welcome to Jailbreak Do It Yourself. My name is Max. I'm here with Alex and Vlad, and we are Friday Apple team. A few words about us. We are a security research team, mostly focused on software and hardware exploitation. We made a various jailbreak for IAS, TVOS, even the watch AS. And we are contributing to a jailbreak community. So before jumping to a jailbreak, let's make a quick overview of IAS security. IAS security starts from a secure boot chain when the each element in a boot chain got uh, properly checked to be signed by Apple and reject the boot chain if, if it's not. The next thing after IOS is loaded is a mandatory code signing. So all code that's running on IS should be signed by Apple or should be signed by a trusted party. The sandbox, which is limiting application access to a file system to some critical APIs, uh, and Apple made a really good work on exploit mitigations like heap and stack, canaries like ISLR, like DEP, and hardening Safari JIT in the iOS 10 release. Next, the data protection, which secure user partition based on a passcode on, or the touch ID. Secure enclave processor, which use it as a secure crypto operations as a provider for Apple Pay. And one more thing is kernel patch protector. It's a new mitigation debuted in iOS 9. It's a special monitor that can continuously check for a kernel integrity. So what is a jailbreak? So basically a jailbreak is a process of ha uh, hacking your device. As, as a user you cannot get a full access to a file system, you cannot run something like SSH daemon on your phone and tunnel uh, to your phone. So in any case, to get a full access and install any third party uh, applications and utils, you need to, jail to jailbreak or hack a device. Nowadays the exploit chain is required. And it could take like up to from three to seven or eight exploits in a chain to get a fully untethered jailbreak. As we talk about the untether, there are two types of jailbreaks, tethered and untethered. The main difference is, is in a tethered jailbreak, it effect will be invalidated after the device got rebooted. So this means after the device rebooted, you need to run exploit again, which do all the kernel patches. In the case of untethered, jailbreak will be running automatically on device boot. So the next thing is what are the possible initial attack vector? How to like install the payload which contain a jailbreak on a device? The most easy and the most popular way is making an application archive, install it on the device, which will basically uh, trigger the exploit code. The USB payload is pretty, um, pretty good attack. We can exploit USB commands itself or use USB as a one of the stages when the file was exploited got copied to a device and will be used in the, by the next stage. Of course, the WebKit, SMS, and Baseband, like mobile Safari, like any um, libraries that you do uh, image rendering in uh, iMessages, and of course, Wi Fi and uh, LTE Baseband. That's a really good target for remote jailbreaks. So let's assume you want to make a jailbreak and you have a zero days. Well, in this case, uh, the process will be not that hard. You just need to write exploit chain, which will patch out all the security restrictions uh, in the system, optionally install persistent binary and SSH or any other remote shell. But as we know, the zero days are pretty expensive. So what if you don't have a zero days? Jailbreak is still doable. As there are so many uh, public POCs and uh, write-ups uh, on iOS bugs. Like uh, Google Project Zero do a really great thing by publishing POCs and the Pango team, Pango block is really good. They, they describe a lot of iOS exploitation. The main difference is that uh, all those public sources, they do not contain the information how to make a full jailbreak, how to uh, disable IOS restrictions, how to bypass the kernel patch protection, which is really, really critical if you want to make any kernel patch. So that's the things we want to uh, solve in our talk. We want to show a step-by-step -step guide how to make a jailbreak at home. So I will start with arbitrary code execution strategies or how to bypass initial uh, code, initial code signing checks. So first of all, there's a well-known techniques, return-oriented programming, 
which is well documented, and I will not focus on it uh, too much. The next thing is binary with uh, much of bug. So, uh, main idea is to exploit dynamic linker and hide executable segment uh, by overlapping it with non executable. So, when kernel see binary, it see okay, it says there is no executable segment, so I should not check a code sign here. Next thing is JavaScript core. JavaScript core is very interesting because it contains a special memory region that could be readable, writable, and executable in the same time. So, if we can exploit it and leak, the JIT region address, we can overwrite it with a shell code and basically, yeah, run and sign code. There is, of course, there are pools, many way to, um, to run and sign code or sign it code. Now Apple allow any Apple ID, uh, use it as a code signature, but this signature will be invalidated in a week. The next thing is a sandbox. So a wish to attack sandbox is time of check, time of use bugs in combination with the symlinks. So, for example, uh, we can use a race condition in a services, in mobile installation services, that will verify a file, and before it got copied to a file system, we can replace a file on the disk. Or use a symlinks attack, uh, for example, changing the path in a playlist uh, to something we control, which leads when the application will be installed by mobile installation services, it will install our file to an interesting path that's followed by a symlink. XPC. XPC is a really good mechanism to uh, communicate between the processes. And if we found the XPC bug, we can basically send action commands to other processes. Hey, please copy this file from folder A to folder B or mode this file to, to be executable and so on. XPC is pretty powerful. And if we get a kernel write primitive, uh, the sandbox bypass is really trivial. We can disable it locally for our process by updating the proc structure in a kernel memory, or even globally uh, by patching a kernel. I will show it a little bit later. The next thing is, what are the strategies to escalate privileges and why we really need it? So in IS, most of the critical system APIs, they require you to be root for usage. Like task for PID, host get special port, even remount can be used without being root. So the general idea is to find a service that's running as root and find what libraries it is loading. And base it on code sign by pass or base it on something like jump to a rope chain before uh, code sign in the library will be triggered. We can run a code with a system, with a, with a root privileges. Again, the kernel page, if you get a kernel right, it's pretty easy to update the kernel memory, the correct structure, and write uh, root permission there. I will show it a little bit later. The next thing is Kaiser so Apple introduced uh, address space layout optimization starting with iOS 4.3. And they added uh, KSLR to, to a kernel starting from iOS 6. So the idea behind the mitigation is that kernel address got randomized each time devices boot. And for attacker, before like, attacking or patching a kernel, he need to know where it is located. A pretty popular way to bypass KSLR is information leak. So the idea is to, that we can use something like structure size mismatching and uh, some of the kernel memory will be copied to a user mode. And usually one pointer is enough to understand the kernel base address. Mark Dowd and uh, Targeman, they made a really good write-up on their on, uh, early random uh, weaknesses which allow to even the brute force the Kaiser slide, as well as work by Esther. I can say even in iOS 10, it's possible to brute force uh, KSLR. All we need is a kernel read primitive and continuously check for a kernel header in a memory. So for example, Ironbeer was using this technique in the Mac portal jailbreak. The next thing is DEP, data execution prevention. Uh, again, JavaScript core is a really good target as it uh, contains the JIT region, which is writable, readable, executable. If you can leak this address, overwrite it with a shell code, we bypass a dep. Uh, it could be attacked from a user land. Uh, for example, if you found a bug in a way how the pages got locked. For example, we can map a writable page, overwrite it with a shell code, switch it to be executable, and if we found any way to lock a page, it will be never page out and code sign 
handler will be uh, not triggered on this page. Basically, we can run shell code in a user mode. So the last attack we know was in IS 9.3 using mlog or IS service. Of course, we can do a kernel page. So with a kernel page, we can uh, overwrite VM map enter, VM map protect, and uh, with this easily allocate readable, writable, executable pages in user land. If there are no other options, ROP is still an option, return or in program away. So the next problem is there are so many kernel builds, there are so many devices, and making like a table with all the offsets is not a trivial task. So we need to solve a problem how to find the offsets for patch just dynamically in a member. So for these purposes, patch finders I use it. There are a few ways to make a patch finder, like a static or a dynamic. Uh, static patch finder is based on string or byte references. Uh, then you find a uh, xref to it and made additional instruction analysis for find a function start or interesting variable or so. Again, it's not that good as it based it on a, on a pattern matching. Other ways to make it is a dynamic patch finder. Idea behind it, there is a structs in a kernel that never, never really change it. For example, syscall, CTL, uh, match syscalls. Those tables just grow, so they did not really change anything in, in the middle. So as soon as you can leak the address of syscall table, you automatically resolve more than 500 uh, functions in a kernel. In combination with instruction emulations, uh, instead of byte patterns, it will be like a pretty powerful tool. So let's assume we have a patch finder. Uh, what we should patch in a kernel to get a, like, a jailbreak? We need to make the page to become, easily become a root. We made the page to easily export kernel task port, which is a task repeat. We need to disable code sign informants, sandbox, and finally remount system partition as readable or writable. I will focus on each of these patches a little bit detail. So escalating privileges. As I say, uh, most of the APIs, critical system APIs, they require root to work. Task for PID, mount, uh, host get special ports, and so on. So in a case to use these APIs, we need to escalate privileges. A pretty popular way is if we bypass a kernel page protector to patch a kernel directly, which is a set ID syscall, which is a, there is a check that uh, comparing real UID with effective UID. There's like a set of these checks. So all we need to do to find it uh, in a set ID function and basically patch to skip this condition at all. This is how it looks like. So it's a set ID function. There is like a set of checks that comparing uh, real UID with effective UID. So all we need to patch is to make sure there is uh, that the code will be not jump in this condition. The next thing is a kernel task. So uh, the task port is a type of mac port type, and uh, it has a pointer to the struct task in a kernel memory. So it, if you have a uh, send write to this uh, port, we can control over virtual memory of any process we can control of the threads and so on. So in a case of kernel, if you get a kernel task port, we can control the kernel memory. So it's like readable, writable primitive. It, we can allocate memory in a kernel, and so on. Uh, there is a lot of utils that require kernel task port to be exported. Most of these utils are for working with a kernel. So what are the possible ways to export the kernel task port? First of all, there is a function called task for PID, which is basically a return the task port for interesting PID. And of course, there are checks to make sure we cannot export the kernel task. So we can patch this one. We can even reimplement the task for PID in ROP. The basic idea to implement only the functionality we need and skip in the checks. It may be not, not that trivial. Uh, and uh, if there are no other ways, we can always find a kernel task port uh, in a memory and export it. This is how the task for PID page may, may look like. So uh, Apple hard-coded ch check for PID0, which is a kernel PID, to make sure that any process cannot export the kernel task. So what we need to do, we need to null out this check. But it's not that easy. 
as it there are additional checks in a case if you are running not as root. So if you are not root, we need to patch out task for PID POSIX checks. Again, we need to patch out PID zero check and patch out chaos correct issue. So these two additional checks, which are checking for, do we have a permissions to export this task port and are we running as root? Uh, again, to get that task port for interesting process. Next thing is Apple mobile file integrity. So it's like a main module that is checking for uh, that code is signed, that uh, it is properly signed by a certificate, that the entitlements match the hashes that are in a code sign, uh, it grants access to other processes task force and have a restrictions on a map and, and so on. So it's like a pretty, pretty powerful kernel extension. And for sure for making a full jailbreak we need to disable Amphi. A few ways of doing that, there is a really interesting um, boot argument called the Amphi get out of my way. Uh, in, it is, doesn't exist on release um, kernels and release device, but there is, it, but Amphi still respect this boot argument. So this means if you find the variable that reads the value of Amphi get out of my way and patch it directly in kernel, you will get Amphi get out of my way functionality. The same thing, we need to enable the debug mode. The debug mode will disable a lot of um, security features like a code sign and uh, like something in a remount. Other way, we can patch only interesting policies uh, directly in Amphi text. This is how it looks like. So as I say, Amphi init respect Amphi and Amphi get out of my way boot arguments. If they exist, it reads the uh, uh, corresponding value of this boot argument and set the variables. So we can directly patch those variables to get Amphi get out of my way functionality. The next thing is Amphi policy patches. So Amphi kernel extension have a pointer to Mac policy configuration which is basically a structure and one of the fields contain Mac policy operations. And these operations are basically pointers to Mac hooks, Amphi Mac hooks. So what we can do, we can look for Apple mobile file integrity string, find a reference to it and a few instruction uh, on top, we will see a reference to Mac policy operations, which is like an array like this and if we null out all of these pointers, no Amphi hooks will be triggered. We can, uh, well, there is, there is a list of Amphi policies to patch and we can patch only the interesting one. So as we see here, there is M map checks like for a team ID, uh, there is M protect check, there is even um, file check library validation or we not check signature. So there's a lot of interesting things here. Next thing is a sandbox. As I say, sandbox prevents uh, application of getting full access to a file system, it prevents of usage of the critical system APIs and if you want to use these APIs you basically need to patch the sandbox. There's a few ways of doing it in iOS. There's a function called SB evaluate which triggers in the most of sandbox hooks. So basically it's grant uh, access for, for an action. The action could be different like a file access, like a export kernel task or so. So we can patch this SB evaluate always return true. So everything is granted for any action. Well, it's, it's doable, but not a good idea because it will lead that any application downloaded from App Store or for, uh, or any third party application now will full, ha have full access to a file system, which is not good, which is a really big privacy leak. So better to just hook SB evaluate and uh, check for interesting action and grant access only for interesting action we need or as an alternative way, patch sandbox Mac policies directly. This is how it looks like. Again, uh, sandbox kernel extension have a pointer to Mac policy configuration, which is a structure, which is one of the field have uh, Mac policy operations pointer. Mac poli policy operations, basically a pointer to a sandbox hooks. So if you look for Sidbell sandbox policy string in a sandbox extension, We'll find a reference to it and a few uh, bytes to the app, we'll see a, 
a, a few bytes uh, bottom story, we will see a pointer to Mac policy operations and the Mac policy operation will look like this. So it's like an array which contain a pointers to hooks. So we can null out every state or null out just interesting hooks. So here is an incomplete list of uh, sandbox hooks. For example, as we see, bind got check it, uh, stat got check it, uh, mount got check it, rename, and so on. So we can disable only like partial hooks. The next thing is a mac mount, and my friend Vlad will talk more about that. Okay, let's discuss mac mount problem. So, if you need to uh, change iOS configuration, uh, install persistent, and uh, many other examples, uh, you have to remount uh, root partition, which is uh, read only access by default without jailbreak. But you can just uh, call mac mount uh, syscall because there are many checks inside it. Uh, so we have two general ways how we can uh, bypass this problem. First, we can uh, just patch these checks. First, you can uh, call mac mount command function. So actually, mac mount uh, call mac mount after all its checks. So if you look at mac mount uh, syscall, uh, you will see code that uh, prevents uh, mounting uh, partitions with other flags other than read only. So if we patch this check, we can uh, call mount function from user mode. But that's not all because uh, there are additional checks inside uh, lightweight volume manager kernel extension. Uh, method called uh, map fire. So root partition is still write only access. Okay, first of all we need uh, patch map fire uh, check and uh, from iOS 9.3.2 first beta, uh, first appear a new function called pay I can has kernel configuration. So you need to bypass this check too. Uh, here you can see two checks inside mapfire function. Uh, first call pay I can has kernel configuration. Uh, you can uh, patch it in different ways. For example, you can patch just got inside white volume, volume manager and uh, you can just force uh, return one in the pay I can has kernel configuration function itself. And second check, uh, check uh, is right protected flag uh, of partition class. So you can uh, patch this uh, byte directly or you can uh, just patch this check. But for that you need uh, bypass kernel patch protection. It's uh, next big topic and Alex will explain you. Hello everyone. So as you noticed we need to make <coughs> quite a few patches. And kernel patch protection is a thing preventing us from doing that. So let, uh, let's take a look how it works and how to bypass it. So kernel patch protections randomly checks for kernel pages, uh, translation tables, and some system registers. It's also executing on exception level three, so we can't really disable it. But uh, we can apply patches and remove it between checks. But is there any other way? Yes, it is. So let's dive into the deep into the uh, iOS and find out how it works. So it all starts with uh, interrupt. The interrupt uh, handler sets the CP ACR access trap on EL1 and then it sets the SMID uh, 14 point register uh, instruction trap for EL0. Then it disables interrupts to prevent uh, going to this handler again. Then on exception level zero, uh, when SMID or 14 point instru instruction is executed, uh, the trap is triggered where the kernel is emulating a floating point instruction or SMID instruction and then it's actually trying to remove the S SMID trap uh, by changing CP ACR register. This triggers another trap in uh, exception level three 
And th there, the kernel checks all the hashes for the uh, translation table pages and registers. Then it removes uh, CPACR trap, and then it removes uh, SMID floating point trap, and finally it skips, uh, jumps over the instruction, the CPACR instruction in the uh, AL1. Then it enables interrupts again, so the next time it will start it from scratch. So as you can see, we can't really stop kernel patch protection from checking original pages, but if you think about it for a moment, we can't really stop kernel patch protection from changing original pages. So let's say we're gonna use pages which are not so original. Take a look at the translation table. We have several levels and the pages. Now let's copy the level one table. So after the copy, we have descriptors pointing to the original level two table. Now let's create another copy of the level two table and change descriptor in the level one table to actually point to this new uh, allocated one. So this, uh, this is what we have. So now we repeat the same trick for the level three table, like that. So now we have level three copy with all the descriptors pointing to the original pages in the kernel, for the kernel. So now let's allocate some pages in the kernel which we really want to patch and then update uh, descriptors in the uh, level three like that. So essentially we have two tables. One is a original tables, a table and an, uh, another one is the partial copy of translation table with our pages patched. So it all looks com complicated uh, and you actually need to consider a lot of uh, where things like granules, then uh, initial levels and addressing region. Um, in fried apple we love tools and uh, in order to manipulate table translation easily, we actually implemented the barbecue framework. So this framework helps us to walk through the descriptors on the various levels and modify it if necessary. Then it's a C++ template-based lightweight framework with a C wrapper. So it can uh, relocate tables for you in just literally a couple of lines. And also, the big bonus, it can check some of your dumped mistakes on the compile time. So, but let's get back to the bypass technique. So, as I mentioned above, the uh, CPACR access triggers uh, kernel patch protection checks. But let's replace it with branch with link uh, uh, instruction to some uh, CPACR trampoline, which we place somewhere in the kernel, like replacing the knobs. And this trampoline actually jumps to the shell code. Let's call it CPACR hook. In this CPACR hook, we are restoring the original values of TTBR then we actually trigger uh, CPA, uh, KPP by accessing CPACR, and then when everything is done and all checks are performed, we're restoring the, uh, our fake values of TTBR. But is it it? Uh, well, not really, because our devices like to sleep, and when they wake, the kernel actually restores all the CPU state. Uh, and during this restore process, there's a function called TTBR restore, and our fake TTBRs are actually overwritten with original ones. So, like, the address of this TTBR restore is calculated uh, based on a virtual base plus some offset. We can't change this offset, but what we can do, we can replace a virtual base. So, if we hack it, like, uh, you can see this formula on the right, and then we are falling into the TTBR restore hook function. In this TTPR restore function, which is a shell code, obviously, we can restore the virtual base. Then we need to restore the VBAR register. Then we need to set our fake TTPR registers and then call the original TTPR restore, skipping just two first instructions. Now KPP is finally bypassed. But this trick unfortunately closed, it closed in uh, iOS 10.2. But there's another one when you can hook uh, the deep sleep and idle sleep handlers as well. But it's a lot more involved, unfortunately. So after that, you may like to have all the same patches in the kernels applied when your device rebooted. In order to do that, this is called persistence, and in order to do that, you need to find service that spawns on boot. Then you need to make sure that it's actually running in root. And then you need to find some user land code sign bug, and then using the sim link to a system service, you can exec this binary to bypass code sign. So in our jailbreak, we're using JavaScript core interpreter which is signed by Apple, and what's good about it, it can execute code in our React segment. So we are copying in at a system service to be spawned on boot. 
So that's what it looks like. So we're replacing RT by DD service by GSC and then we're creating early boot uh file which is essentially a JavaScript exploit with a payload. So when the system starts it executes RT by DD minus uh early boot which essentially JavaScript with JavaScript exploit. So it uh, it's it looks easy but the payload needs to be crafted specially because uh you don't have much load or anything like that in there. So our payload doesn't actually have import and uh we need to find in the memory deal sim then we need to update address then we need to resolve all the import and then finally we using some code sign bypass trick we need to run our jailbreak binary to restore all the patches in the kernel. So after that it's nice actually to have some SSH access to your I device. So you can do this in two different ways you can install CDA or copy drop, drop beer. Then on a desktop computer you're just using TCP relay which creates a tunnel to your device and then you use regular SSH with a password alpine to access your device. But it's not really needed for security researchers but for most people uh jailbreaks means CD. And to install CD you need to copy tar somewhere then you need to use tar to extract CD or bootstrap to put all the files to the right places. And then if you don't want CD to sim link all the system files to some to bigger partition because system partition is pretty small, uh we need to create a CD no stash file which prevents CD from doing this. Then you need to use UI cache to flash UI uh, and finally get a CD icon on the screen. As we know Apple is working hard on security enhancements and in iOS 10 they introduced quite a few. So let's uh the First one is like next uh, new uh, heap layout, but it's very well described and by various security researchers and many many write ups and articles. So I would like to concentrate on AMFI, sandbox, and uh, kernel patch protection. So speaking about AMFI, they introduced new function miss validate signature and copy info, which is actually using CD hash and can't be hooked or replaced with just CDF equal to bypass code sign easily. Then they fix the race condition and validate code directory hash and daemon. So you can't replace file uh, after signature is checked. But policy patches still work. So for as for sandbox they introduced new profiles, new operations and new hooks. So if you need to get uh something some functions to work so you need to patch some of these new hooks and policies as we described above. But most important thing is uh KPP enhancements. So they introduce new kernel cache layout when the code and the uh, data cons they stitch together. So and got segments are actually protected so no more like easy hooks. And interesting thing they actually introduce some hardware mitigations on iOS 7 and iOS 7 plus. So let's talk about these hardware mitigations. So they started to use thing called AMCC which we believe stands for Apple uh, memory control chip or access memory control chip which watches memory region for any access and it prevents writing inside the region or execute code outside the region. Let's take a look how it's initialized. So on the start kernel performs several stages to initialize itself and one of these stages is actually uh AMCC initialization. So they're actually taking the prelink uh, uh virtual address and then last virtual address of the segment and then converting them to physical address. Then they're using these values to set AMCC registers. Then they're stationing these values as well in the global variables. As we know after divide wakes we need to restore the CPU state. So what happens in a low level uh reset handler they're actually restoring all the AMCC registers from these stash ones. So now we have kernel patch protection working back again. So what is the future of jailbreaks? It's not that shiny because iOS is getting more and more secure and more and more stuff has moved to the hardware side. Also exploits uh will be more valuable and unlikely appear on the public. But there will be still bugs and nice write ups and researchers will share some researchers will share information for free. So there is still hope. Now let's go to the demo and I would like to know that if we have a different exploit chains for the uh for our jailbreaks the actual structure and the flow is almost identical. So let's start with 4.1 jailbreak and I would like to ask Max to help me with that. Yeah, thank you Alex. Yeah so uh we made a very jailbreaks and we start for them in 841 jailbreak. So the uh, general idea that we made the same structure in all jailbreaks for iOS 8, iOS 9, iOS 10. Uh and we're trying to connect oops. 
we're trying to connect to a device uh, using the known port on a device. In a local host, um, TCP relay and lo local host on a uh, known address. So as we see, the connection got refused. So we're running iDevice syslog to show like step by step how the exploit works. So we're starting from, a patch, from a exploiting a kernel, finding the patches, uh, writing patches to a kernel, and finally starting an SSH. So now if you're trying to connect to a device, the connection will succeed. And to prove that there is like basically the same uh, kernel version that we just found it, we'll compare the external versions here. So as we see, the external version is the same. Yeah, the next jailbreak is iOS 9 jailbreak. And this one differs from other ones because it has a persistence in it. Yeah, again, the same structure. So we're trying to connect the device for a known port. Connection got refused. Uh, now we filter uh, everything in iDevice syslog to show only the our exploit and con connection in, uh, connected and disconnected in events. So exploit got started. Kernel dump it, patches apply it. We install the persistent binary, which means that the next time the device will be booted, it will run our exploit once again. Now I try to connect to a device with the same address, and it succeeds. We got a shell. Uh, we use uname dash a to prove that XNU version is the same we just exploited. So the next thing, I'm going to reboot a device and prove that uh, Explode will be run once again when the system will be booted. It may take some time as kernel loads, kernel load all the extensions, it loads all the system services. So it's usually based on a, on a device type. It's pretty fast on 6S and 7. Unfortunately, we can't have logs from our payload, so like uh, we're waiting. Yeah. Yeah. As we see here, ex after the device got connected, exploit starts again. But now we are not installing uh, the persistent binary, and uh, it's found in the SSH. So we're trying to connect the device once again using the same address. We got a shell. We use uname dash a. Again, we like comparing the Xenu versions on a, in a log and device we just found it. They're the same. The next demo is iOS 10. And you please know that it has exactly the same flow. So, but yeah. the exploit chain is actually different. Yeah, we just, just want to show with all the demos that the structure is the same, uh, but uh, the only one thing that's different is actually the exploitation. So again, trying to connect the device. Connection got refused, running kernel exploit which you'll find and apply all the patches and spawn in SSH. Now if you try to connect to a device with the same address, we got the shell spawned. You name the A and the version is the same. The next is tvOS, which is a different device, but apparently the same structure. Yeah, look, look. we get a, uh, Apple TV 4 and we say, okay, so it's pretty similar than the IS, why not, why not exploit the TV? So this is how it looks like. Again, we're trying to SSH to a TV. It's not working. Uh, we take the similar exploit as we use it for iOS 10 uh, with uh, some various modification to a kernel patch protector. Click in a base, dump in a kernel, find in the patches, found in SSH. Now we try to SSH to a TV. So the TV that we just show, uh, it was Apple TV 4 uh, running tvOS 10.1. So as you see, we got a shell spawned on a TV. And with the uname dash A, we can prove that the version is the same that just spawned. Finally, watchOS, totally different device, but who would have thought same structure? Yeah, so uh, we got a watch and ask, hmm, why not? Why not try to pound the watch? 
So it's, it's, the exploitation is a little bit different uh, as you, we cannot connect directly to a watch. So we need to set up a Bluetooth proxy over the watch and the uh, iOS device and proxy between the device and a Mac. It makes some time because watch is slow device. And we have and to use Xcode, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, iDevices log cannot read the watch log. So that's why we need to use uh, Xcode output to show how the exploit works. It will take some time because uh, watch is a pretty slow device, unfortunately. But like, let's be patient. Okay, it's running. It's just a couple of seconds. Yeah, yep. we got exploit starting on a watch. It's obviously it will be uh, more slowly. Like kernel dump sometimes take like for 20 seconds for us. Yeah, now it's a little bit faster. Yeah, we got SSH spawn it. So the next step, what we need to do, we need to set up the Bluetooth proxy over the device and the uh, port 22 on a watch. I use a script that uh, I written to bind port 533 to a watch port 22. And I just SSH to this known port on a device. As we see, the shell got spawned on a watch. You get your name. We got a root external version on a watch one two, and it's exactly the same we just show in Xcode. So the watch is spawned. Okay, let's sum up this talk. So jailbreak is totally doable with just public bugs and public write-ups, and you can use patches and uh, description for KPP bypass from this talk to jailbreak all devices and excellent. Yeah. So the Check the XNU. XNU is a great source of bugs and possible zero days, and as well as doing a really great um, help to understand how the kernel works. So we, we spend a lot of time uh, inspecting the XNU sources. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we are Friday Apple team. Um, if you have questions, follow us on Twitter, and I think we still have a time for questions.